Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name's Matthew, and today, welcome to our webinar. We're going to be having lots of fun today uh, talking about Squid Game and the high stakes game design. When uh, we were watching um, the series when it came out, we were having, I really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. One night we were talking about uh, Squid Game, one of our Friday night uh, catch ups at the end of the week, and I actually started doodling out the glass bridge level. Um, there and then, and it kind of snowballed from there. I thought, actually, let's do a whole webinar and talk about all of the fun and excitement of uh, Squid Game and all of the game logic that's going on in there. We thought it'd be an interesting subject to cover off. So we're going to be running through it, how to apply abstract game design thinking to different situations and games, how to build simple models and machinations. So this is ideal for people who haven't used machinations too much yet and want to learn how to kind of apply game design logic to their their own processes and how to test the outcome of your game designs while you're doing that i'll introduce myself my name is matthew i'm the evangelist for machinations i've been kicking around in the games industry for quite a while now uh working on all different types of projects Cesar, are you going to introduce yourself this time yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Cesar. I'm a diagram craftsman for Machinations, and I will be Matthew's co-host for this evening. Fantastic. And I think we've got a couple of the team and I, Hori, is lurking around in the chat to keep things flowing in there as well. Uh, at the end of today's session, we're going to turn off the recording, invite anybody that wants to come and chat to us about the content we've done today, or just game design in general. We'll be running that session directly at the end of the webinars session. Um, obviously a massive warning for spoiler alerts. We're going to be talking about Squid Games and the different levels in there. I thought I'd kick off a quick poll and just ask people, has everybody seen Squid Game already? Is there anybody who um, hasn't watched it yet uh, that's come along? Uh, so I've launched a quick poll. Just let us know uh, how much we need to explain about Squid Game as we're going through it and what the different uh, games are. I'll give you a couple more seconds and then I'll uh, close the vote. So luckily, um, most people have watched it. So 77% of people have watched uh, Squid Game. A few of you are part of the way through it, so I'm sorry, there's going to be spoilers. And a couple of people who haven't watched any of it yet, the good news is we'll be talking about the game logic, the amazing storyline that weaves its way through it. We're not going to be talking about, so we're not going to completely spoil it for you. Um, all right, let's talk about what we're going to be going through. Um, so round one, we're going to be talking about uh, red light, green light, and we'll explain more of that when we kind of come to it. The second round is in the honeycomb cookie type thing where you've got to cut out a shape uh, inside the honeycomb. Uh, the tug of war, which uh, is a really interesting model. We had lots of fun. I think it was the most complex model out of all of them that we built for this session. Uh, we're going to do the marble round and talk about the how to kind of build those types of models. Uh, into Glass Bridge, which is actually the first model I built of the game, purely because it's um, there's a lot of chance and a lot of randomness baked into the Glass Bridge level. So I found that really appealing to my brain, and uh, I was in enticed to build a model for it, which Chesa then dramatically improved for me. So we'll, we'll we'll show my approach to it and how we got there, and then obviously into the very last um, last level, which is then kind of a Squid Game. Uh, as always, we please do ask your questions in chat. There will be a recording of this session afterwards for you to go through and review. And all of the models um, that we've created for today's session will be sharing out in the community. Uh, so if you, I don't know if I've published them yet, but if you click on my name in the community, you can then go and have a look at them. Uh, but I'm going to do another uh, quick poll just to find out how familiar everybody is with machination so far. So have you not used it yet? Just some doodles, some subsystems, full meta, or have you got everything in there? Excellent. And while that's going I'm, through... I'm seeing a lot of, of uh, people saying that they didn't understand the last Squid Game. Uh, that's fine because we didn't either. We <laughs> kind of substituted that for another game. So <laughs> yeah. that, that question true. will not be answered today. Yeah. All right. I'll end the poll there and share the results. So we've got 
plenty of people who have not used machinations yet that's fine we're going to be walking through each of the each of the constructions and how they're built as we go through them um a few people going all the way to everything in there which is fantastic this is the first model i always like to kick off whenever i'm approaching um, a new project inside machinations rather than trying to go into super granular detail always like to kick off with a very high level core loop so anyone that's kind of joined one of our sessions before will be familiar with this process where rather than working out the exact details we just do something very very simple so here for squid game kind of kicked off with you know what's the the high level loop or the very high level model of of the system and it starts off with a source as many models do and this time, rather than looking at different logic, each resource inside machinations is going to be representing one player. So if I hit one step, what we're going to do, we're going to take from our source and we're going to generate a random number of players. I assumed as I was watching through this, imagining this world of being the game designer um, inside Squid Game, it's going to be a pretty high pressure job. And you're going to want to have to test to make sure that your games are going to entertain your VIPs. A lot of the time we're thinking about what's the player experience for the whole of squid game as the game designer you'd be thinking about well what's it going to be like being uh having to entertain these vips and make sure they get to bet as much as they can how can we get as much money from them as possible and how can we make sure that we've got enough players going to, into each of the different stages to make sure that it's uh they get all the way to the end and we don't end up eliminating too many players too early one of the first challenges you're going to face as this uh, game designer is you're never really sure how many players are going to be coming into the game to start off with. So here to represent this, I'm using a source. So sources generate resources. There's infinite numbers of resources in them. And I'm using the on enable activation state. And what this means is that whenever we um, start our simulation, any objects which have got that on enable state will carry out their action on the first attempt, uh, and then they'll sit there passively waiting for something else to trigger them. On the resource connection here, I'm using a couple of different techniques. So I've got 200, so it's a minimum of 200 players we're gonna get, then plus D300, which is a 300 sided dice, if such a thing could exist. And that's gonna give me a number between one and 300. So as I've started that, it's going to be a different number every time, but this time it's 397. Now, as I'm going through my simulation, I want to keep track of how many players do we have at each stage. If I just fired these into my round one, I would lose that number there. So I'm using a node connection between players entering the game and getting ready for round one. If I hit one more step, you'll notice this pool is then fired into the round one gate and I've got my output but it enables me to keep track of how many players entered the game in the first place by using that node connection then I've got another node connection after round one uh, to show how many players are going to be going into round two so a real quick tip if there's a number that you want to keep track of um, inside a pool and you don't want to lose that number at the end of your simulation using a node connection is a great way of doing that now the next object we have here is a gate and this gate's representing round one for me and just to kick things off i'm going to assume there's roughly a 50 percent um success rate in the in round one so i'm going to send 50 percent of my players into this pool to be the survivors or the people completing it and 50 percent of them into eliminated now you'll notice this isn't exactly 50 percent we had 397 go in and had 192 come out and that's because of the way machinations handles monte carlo simulations to simulate real world odds of things actually happening if you toss a coin 10 times statistically you should have five heads five tails in reality you almost never get five heads five tails because it's random using these gates with this random um distribution technique each resource that comes through it effectively tossing a coin for it to say whether or not they uh, go into each of those pools. So round one, I've then got 192. And if I carry this on, we then have round two, we've got 99 survive into the next step where we have 
after round three, we've got 46. Next one, we've got 29. After round five, we've then got 13. And the final round six, we've then got uh, just the one survive. Uh, and that's randomness. Now, with machinations, we want to do some testing before we start going through designing each of our different levels. So I'm going to do some batch plays. Down the bottom here, we've got a couple of options. I was stepping through it one step at a time. I was then doing play and kind of playing the, the simulation. And then with batch plays, this enables me to um, take all of my model, send it up to AWS Lambda, parallelize its execution, and give me some results back. So down the right-hand side here, here's all my different numbers. Um, and I'm look at how many players did we have on average coming in. And here on average, I had 371. And the important number for me then at the end is then after round six, I think it's because I've got a, this in there. I'm going to quickly change that. Let's just do 10 steps. I'll do another 20 quick plays. Grab my data. So I can then see my average at the end of this just going 50%, 50%, 50% resulted in an average of 4.2 players reaching it past all six stages. Um, the important thing there is a minimum value of one. That'd be great. That'd be ideal. We just got the one winner. Uh, we've got a maximum value of six there. And obviously these odds are going to change slightly as we go through and work out our exact models. There's a question. What is the plus one node? I kind of missed that. Or oh, we, we can go again really fast through. Yeah. So what a plus one will do, a plus one is a node connection. So anytime we have this configuration between a pool and then another pool using a state connection. Uh, it's going to mean that I'll hit step here. So we've got 237 resources here. The second the resources are added to this pool, it's going to add plus one resource into this pool. So it's just a way of kind of quickly duplicating up your resources. And as I said, the important thing here is that when I hit step again, we're firing these resources through round one but I want to keep track of that number and I don't want to lose it. So it's a really helpful way, especially when you're doing models, you might want to preserve one bit of information. Really common use is if you're doing a, um, how many coins has the player got? You might want to keep track of how many coins they've collected in total and then how many they have at that current moment. Yeah, I think it's time we get into each of the games. Perfect. So I'm going to kick off with Round one. And please do just keep dropping any questions you have inside the um, inside the chat as we go along or inside the Q&A and Cesar will keep an eye on it. Yeah, what? if there are questions that we've already explained, I'll save them from for the end of the webinar. Uh, so we will come back to them. If there are questions that are for the current uh, model that we're presenting, then we'll answer them on the spot. So. Excellent. So for red light, green light, uh, I must admit this model is more for aesthetically pleasing purposes than anything, but I thought I'd walk through it quickly and kind of explain what we've built here and how we've simulated red light, green light. So for those of you that don't know, I know with different parts of the world that call this game something different, um, but the key to this is you gradually walk, try to get from one side to the other side. As you approach, um, there's somebody there whose job it is to try and spot you moving. So they turn your back while they've got their back turned to you, you can walk forward. But if they turn to face you, you've got to stay perfectly still. And if they see you moving, they call you out. Or in the, in the case of um, Squid Game, you get eliminated by some nasty sniper that's going to take you out. So the way in which we've built this is we're going to kick off, we're going to put all of our players into the game, just using that on enable state of a source to start off with. And we're going to generate our players, 456, there's a convenient number. The next thing is, uh, then there's the odds of the player moving forward. Now, the way in which I 
tried to break this down slightly was to think about you know how how often is the red light going to be going off how often is it going to be uh can you, can you zoom in a bit yeah, so, yeah. Sorry. i've got too much stuff on my screen i'm going to move i'm going to close my chat windows you keep an eye on them Chesa. yeah sure uh so what i've created here is we've got a one resource inside a pool here which is our green light and this is an automatic uh pool so it's set to pull any so any resources that were inside the red light would get pulled over to green and it's starting off with one resource there if i play this for a moment i'm then using a gate as a automatic trigger to pull that resource into the red light so whenever this there's a 10 percent chance of using this gate of it triggering this pull this is a passive pull set to pull any so when it gets triggered it's going to pull that green light over into the the resource from the green pool into the red pool while that resource is in there it's going to make mean that this pool is then active so i've got a greater than zero and i'm running this too quickly so i'm going to slow it down uh there we go so now that i've kind of created this red light green light logic and it's randomly being triggered way in which i've decided when players will get eliminated or not is i've got a random number of players progressing each step so i did this with a d3 so it's going to be between one to three players moving forward each time they're coming into these gates and then hopefully they're progressing now as options out after these gates i've got one connection which is coming into the next pool so that would be a success they've made it they're a, a survivor of that step then i've got these other connections which have got a 100 odds of them being selected if they're available and that pool is then available whenever the red light is active so if i watch this for a moment hopefully we'll trigger the red should have made this interactive so i could control it that would have been smart it, 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 uh, it was visible at some point the connections became uh bold and the resources went that way so perfect there we go there so we it's go. gone red any resources that were moving at that moment got caught out and got eliminated unfortunately yeah. and so i built up this kind of this simple logic just to show you know what are the odds of a player being eliminated or not and from that i've then done i've done a bit of copy and paste to um show how how this could work on a bigger scale so from here i've then gone and i've selected five different inputs each one producing 91 different colored resources zoom in a bit more please the reason i've done it with uh different colored resources is just because i thought it looked pretty uh there's no real value to having the different colors in there i could have just done it with one color uh, but i felt it just looked a little bit better so i'm going to speed this up a bit now and we'll play a game of red light, green light. So my players are coming in. This time, the only difference between that small model I showed you is rather than the, the gates themselves being automatic, I'm using another gate with a 25% probability of triggering those gates. So I'm using a gate to trigger a gate, which has got a random number of uh, players that are going to move through it each time. Yeah, which translates to the fact that each step there is a chance that players will try and advance. Uh, they might be too scared to do it, so they might just sit in place. So that's what essentially the 25% chance that means that sometimes some of them are going to try and make a go for it. Exactly. And there, whenever the red light is active, it's pulling those players into these pools to be eliminated. Yeah. And if we progress, we've already got some survivors coming through. And here is where I have got our, our countdown going on and that same logic of red light, green light and a 10% chance of triggering this. Now, as, a, as the game designer at Squid Game, there's a few things that we want to be thinking about in terms of how often um, the red light's going to come on, the frequency or the, the, the pace at which we'd be doing that. 
And in Squid Game, we might also need to think about, well, how many players could we potentially be eliminating at a time? Are we going to have enough snipers to shoot all of them? And you know, all of these different logistical things that we want to think about as players come through it. Most important one we're going to want to be able to check is whether or not the players are going to get through the game. And then are we going to eliminate all of the players in the first round? And then the whole the whole six games are kind of be ruined. Or are we going to be able to build something where enough players will get through um, so that we can uh, enjoy enjoy the next rounds as well? And there we go. So this time, 198 survivors managed to get through the red light, green light. But we want to do some more testing. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some batch plays and fire a number of different players through this. Uh, and now we're going to do 10 simulations using those batch plays and start generating us some data to see how many players are going to get through our red light, green light game. And here come the results are starting to come back in. While those come in, we have two questions. The first one I'm going to answer. Uh, so 25% of the time a player from a pool moves forward, but the others don't proceed. Uh, so each of the batch of players that are grouped in pools have a 25% of moving forward. Uh, it's applied to the batch that is situated inside that pool. If you wanted to be super granular about it, you can create a path for each player, but doing that for 450 players is a bit overkill. Uh, the way we have it is that each round in one batch of those players, up to five of them can try and move with a 25% chance. Uh, it's pretty even. And the other question was that, uh, that's for you, Matthew, maybe. Could you go through how you catch resources that are moving when the red light is active? So how do you kill the player? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, the key to this, just in this little construction here, when the model's uh, running, we've got a countdown, um, just as a timer to make sure that our players uh, move along quickly. We've got a 10% chance of this pool being triggered, just as it has been. While this pool's got a resource in it, I'll try and catch it while it's there, if I can. So I've paused, oh, nailed it, I paused at the right moment. So now that this pool has got a resource in, these pools are, have a condition from the red light to say, if this pool is greater than zero, these pools are available. Uh, these elimination pools, are each connected to each of these gates and they've got a probability of 100 compared to their the kind of continue on to the next step probability of one so there's a hundred to one chance that while this pool's available any players caught moving at this moment will be drained off into our elimination pools hopefully that that answers your question yeah, if you want to be super safe and make sure that no one, like, maybe you, you can make those chances 1 billion instead of 100, for instance, right? Because in, in Matthew's case, the, uh, the case that we have right now, there's a chance that a player might cheat uh, death here, so to speak. And I, I did think about that when I was building it, but I figured maybe there's like a 1 in 100 chance the machine doesn't spot the movie. Yeah, yeah, it. that could and be. I'm quite, that could I'm be. quite happy with that as a as a kind of breakdown um to let them get away with it now in our data now that we've done uh have a bunch of quick runs on this the really interesting thing and actually this is quite realistic which is obviously red light green light is almost a hundred percent skill based um there's very little randomness in it obviously we're using randomness to try and simulate uh, that, that different skill uh, obviously, in the game, there's a very different experience for those players who suddenly realise what they're in for and they try and run away. Um, but I you balanced this so that it was giving a similar sort of result to um, the actual series. So here I'm getting an average of about 228 um, survivors. The interesting thing is then the range of survivors that you could get from a model like this. So here's a minimum of 155 in the most unsuccessful run and a high of uh, 327. So it's a massive range. There's a lot of randomness that we created in the model to kind of simulate the, the different skill levels that could happen within um, a game of red light, green light. Yep. Perfect. I'm going to move on to round two. We are only 25 minutes in and we've already finished the first round. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's round two is a super simple model. That is um, cool. uh, so just to jog your memory, round two is when uh, you the player's got the option to pick a type of cookie, uh, a honeycomb cookie. So to start off with, that's what I'm simulating here at the first step. So I'll do one step. I've got 220 resources. They're coming into a gate. There's a 25% chance of which shape they're going to choose. That an amazing moment where they didn't know what they were um, signing up for when they picked the shape. Uh, and then they found out what the shape uh, actually meant. So from here, this time, very lucky selection. Every time I do this, it'll be a different type of selection. Uh, so here I've got a, a bit more even, make the stars slightly higher, the circle slightly lower. So it's going to randomize that for me. Then I just sort of had a bit of a think around, you know, what are the odds? If you get the triangle, it's the easiest shape to do. Maybe there's a 90% success rate. So I've got D3 players coming into this gate each time. So that's between one and three each step. 90% of these players are going to go on to be survivors. 10% of those players, unfortunately, are going to be eliminated. If you pick the umbrella, maybe there's a 10% chance of being able to um, cut out that umbrella safely or an, and a 90% chance of being eliminated. So as I hit play, each of these gates are going to pull resources from these pools and distribute them into either survivors or into being eliminated. And again, just as I could with my last round, I'm going to do some batch plays and have a look at, see what the survival rate is and see what the spread is on that survival. And as you'd expect, it's uh, not so much of a spread this time because there is less randomness inside this model, but still we're getting anywhere from 110 as the average, 100 minimum, and 121 as the maximum. And that's all from 220 um players entering the game at the start so any questions uh, around this model this is obviously a much simpler model quite a small quick fun one to build there is a question why don't you put all the players into the gate at the same time when carving the cookies i could do um, mostly i just thought it would look a bit better if they came in um differently very easy to kind of adjust that and make those all and there is a, a time in which you need to cart them, right? Yeah, I did think about kind of adding in a timer into this to add some pressure into it and maybe increase the odds of the players coming through these gates based on time. I thought we'd just keep it quite simple. Yeah. Um, there was obviously, the, the biggest decision that kind of gets made is this distribution first, which shape you're going to get is going to have a huge amount of influence over over whether or not you're going to make it through to the next round. Yeah, this is fairly fairly straightforward and simple round. Yeah. In fact, one of the things that you could do with this, it is possible to stack um, gates together. So I could have skipped out these pools altogether and just had uh, that type of construction where it would the players would go through the um, the gate, through the next gate, and do the whole lot in one step if I needed to. Uh, I just added this in there more for aesthetic pleasing purposes than anything else. It can also be for tracking purposes if we want to check out how many players got each shape. So, Yeah. And again, if you're the game designer at, at Squid Game, you'd probably want to be thinking, you know, the logistics of how many cookies you're going to need. You're going to have to get them ready ahead of time. What's the maximum and minimum? What's the maximum number that a shape could be picked if they were just picked at random? And therefore, you know, how much get your logistics ready uh, for an event like this. And more importantly, to think about how many players are going to get eliminated. I've balanced this deliberately so that it's going to be about 50 percent of the players that are going to be eliminated. What we could do if we were, this was a real world is we could actually go through and carry out this process and do some tests to see what's the actual probability of a player being able to complete those different shapes. Uh, we have a question. Does it matter that the link to Umbrella says D3 with uh, lowercase d and not uppercase D3 like the rest? Um, and could you quickly go over what D3 means? So D3 basically means a three-sided dice. Uh, it translates to any number between one and three. 
D15 would be any number between one and 15. Um, the lowercase, uppercase doesn't matter. As long as it's a D, it's going to be treated as a dice. So if you have D and a number after it, it's going to be treated as a dice with as many sides as the number has. It's not a case entity. I'm really pleased you spotted that because I did do that deliberately just so I could show that uh, uppercase and lowercase works. Yeah. It wasn't a mistake, honest. <laughs> right. Now let's get into round three. Uh, certainly one of the most complex models. The, the big one. That we did for this. Uh, and there's lots of logic that's going on here. Cesar, do you want to present this from your screen or should I do it from here? I can present it from my if you want. You your... present it from yours. Yeah, sure. Just... I kicked off this model um, and built some of it. And then actually Cesar came along and made it vastly better. So we'll let Cesar go uh, through. Yeah. It. So what we have in here are the types of players that we get at the beginning of the round. Now, what happened in the show is that, and I tend to believe now that we build a model that it was a deliberate decision, they've encouraged the players to fight each other before the tug of war round, so they could call their numbers to an exact amount that it, they would need to form uh, the, the teams that they needed. So because we are forming teams of 10 players, so essentially one match has uh, 20 players involved, we would need a number that can be divided exactly uh, by 20. Uh, because of that, when I hit the first step and we get uh, a bunch of players in here, so we got 78 of them, that's close to 80, which would have been good because we would have had four sets of teams, but we don't. We, there's not enough players in here to, to have those sets of teams. So what I'm doing at the beginning is simulating that fight that they had and uh, basically taking out all of the extra players that we have in here. So we're killing them off right from the start. They don't even have a chance to participate. Uh, poor souls. For the rest of them, on the on the right here, we are using gate and uh, dragging in 10 players uh, to form teams. So we're going to have six teams in here because 18 of them will be killed off in the next step. If I hit step right now, uh, some of them uh, perished in the fight. The other ones formed six teams. And we're going to have those six teams face off uh, two by two and uh, try to win the tug of war. A beautiful moment for me, actually, kind of building this model and um, like when you when you when I kind of build the model, I kind of really helped me understand what was going on in the in the series because when I watch the series and it's like tug of war, ten players each team. I, oh, there just happens to be. Uh, an exact number of players needed for this round. How, how convenient. And then you think back to that moment of chaos when they, they were allowed to kind of fight each other. And you realize like, no, that was part of the game design. That was part of the process. It was very deliberate. Uh, that way they could have the right number of players coming into the next round. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Um, what we'll have now is on the left here, you'll notice that we have a sort of a timetable, let's call it. We have a resource in here. It's going to move into the reset rope pool that we have on the left. So during the next step, it's going to move here. Uh, what happens with reset rope is that in our tug of war game, we think of uh, the ropes, we call it, let's say, distance. And the rope is at a distance of 500. If the left team pulls it towards them, the distance decreases. If the right team pulls it towards them, the, the distance increases. And as the distance either increases or decreases, the players start to fall off. And once you reach a certain distance, which is either 50 or 950, one of the teams is victorious. Uh, the reset rope step uh, resets the distance of the rope because we're going to be dragging it back and forth to 500. So what's going to happen now in this step, as you can see, we've uh, drained everything that was in there and added 500. So it's in the initial position. Uh, in the next steps, our resource here already moved forward. Uh, in the next step, we're going to be picking team one. So when pick team one comes in, you're going to see that below the, the team section, we have a bunch of gates in here. Some of them are enabled, some of them are disabled. You're going to see that uh, the part that's enabled is on the left, which is the one that will uh, be the first team. So we're going to select randomly between the six teams in here with 100% chance for each. 100% chance for each means that they have equal chances because if we go above 100% when talking about chances, they will always normalize towards 100%. So think of it as 
there is a one in six chance for each team to be picked, but uh, we leave it as 100% because if we were to make it, let's say one sixth, uh, then let's say we only had two teams left in here and both of them have a, a one in six chance to be picked. There's a four in six chance that none of the teams get picked and we wouldn't want that. So in order to guarantee that we always select a team, uh, we've put 100% chances on each of them. Now we're going to select our first team. We've selected the third team and we're going to put it in team one. Now this is pretty interesting and we got really granular and nerdy here. Um, we've made it so that each of our players in a team have a strength. Now strength is something that you kind of either have or don't, right? It's not really debatable. Um, the bigger individuals will have a you know, better time at tug of war, the smaller, weaker ones will, will have a harder time. Uh, our strength is between, I believe, one and 10. Uh, if I'm uh, not wrong, yeah, we have a random int here, as you can see, a random int between one and 11. Now, random in the function uh, will pick a random number between one and 11. It doesn't pick the, the number to the right, so it will only go between one and 10. And this is the strength of our team. This is a pretty strong team. We have a 10 in here. We have a bunch of eights, a nine. So it's it's looking pretty good for the team on the left side. Uh, what we also have on the bottom part here is their contribution in the current step. Now, you may be strong, but if you're going to drag the rope for three seconds and then you're going to be out of breath, you're not going to be contributing very much for your team, right? So there's a bunch of factors that come in here. Your stamina your uh, presence of spirit, your uh, maybe you feel sick, maybe you, I don't know, you have uh, good morale, maybe because you're winning, you have high morale. So their contribution is gonna be based off their strength because their strength gives them sort of a potential that they can achieve. And uh, again, we're gonna use the random, uh, randomness here to determine how much they're contributing per step. So you can see in this specific step that I am, we are in right now, uh, our first person with eight strength contributes 32. Our second person with four contributes only eight. So they're not having a good step right now. The person with 10, even though they're technically the strongest, only contribute with 30. So the one with eight is having a better turn. They're pulling harder this turn. Next turn, it might not be the same. Uh, the chances on the top are fixed. So their strengths are never going to switch during the, let's say, combat phase. Uh, but the ones on the bottom, the contribution will change every step we are doing this uh, by using a pool in here that is updating uh, the registers every step. So every step, this value will change based on the strength of the player. And with this, we sum up everything that goes in there and we uh, achieve a total of the team. And this total is basically going to be how much distance they can pull the rope in one step. Now, this same system will be present on the right side here. So We've picked team one, I'm gonna hit step. We're now gonna pick team two. You can see that the gate on the left became gray. The gate on the right is now uh, waiting to select for team two. We've selected the second batch of players. We're gonna put them in team two. Let's check out their strengths. We got some nines, but we got a bunch of twos, a one. I don't know. I, I'm thinking that the left team is favored in this one, but we'll see how it goes. Now, obviously we also need to start the game. So we're going to be starting the game during the next step. So now that we've started. Yeah. Pause that for a second, Chizar. Do you want to talk about that construction on the left-hand side um, that's kind of controlling the overall model? Okay, uh, sure. So we have our initial resource. This is just here for the start of the execution. Then we move on into the cycling phase. The first thing that we do here is reset the rope. Uh, let me reset and go from the beginning. And yes, the, the reason I did this, and it kind of came up in one of the questions, which is, is the moving of the single resource between nodes, e.g. pick team, acting as a finite state machine that is controlling the rest of the model? And that's absolutely it. I, I, when I started building this model, I was getting confused as to the, my order of things, like what's going to trigger next? Uh, what do I need to do to reset the rope and get it ready for the next set of players and complete things? So rather than try and do that all inside the same model and make it really complicated, I find it really helpful just to build a separate construction that breaks down the steps. And as you'll see, as Cesar kind of goes through this, it, it kind of the the resource will only move once its step once its task has been completed. Um, yeah. So it's a really helpful way of kind of thinking about 
if you've got a complex model like this with lots of different steps to it, rather than trying to build them all inside the model themselves, kind of just separating out the, the order logic that you've got going on. Yeah, think of this as the caretaker of the players, like they tell them what to do. Uh, so in our first step, we're going to move into reset rope. I already covered what that does. We're going to reset the distance of the rope because after the games are finished, the rope is going to be in a, an awkward position, let's say like 50 or something. So that's going to the reset the rope to 500 distance. After that, we're going to be moving into a uh, delay node. This is because we're still setting things up. So we don't want our resource to move forward too quickly. We then pick team one, which I already showcased. We're going to pick uh, from a batch of players in here for team one. Once team one is selected, we're moving forward towards picking team two. So we're now picking team two, which we have. And once we do that, uh, you can see that some connections are turning blue. Those are the triggers which are actually telling the other node, OK, it's time for you to pull the resource. So we picked team two. It's time to start the game now. So in the next step, we're going to move the, the resource to start game. And the resource is going to be in start game until the game is over. So until one of the teams is victorious. What's going to happen now is essentially the teams have this combined effort in uh, the current step. And one of the teams is draining the distance. One of the teams is adding to the distance. Um, and because they're pretty even, you're going to see that there's not a lot of difference between them. They got a pretty good round right now, the ones on the right. They got a, a pretty good one. They're at 455. Now, in the next step, you're going to notice something. Now that we are four, 430, so we've moved a bit from the center. The, the right team is actually pulling a bit harder. Um, this means that the player that was closest to the edge has actually fallen off. And because that player has fallen off, they are now contributing zero to the team's total power. So they're actually a liability more than a health. Now, this is positive reinforcement loop in here because the team that is winning, once you drag a player down or a couple of players down, um, then you start winning more and more. So now the right team should always have the bigger numbers. And you see the numbers get bigger and bigger. More players start to fall on the left side. So and the quick, more players yeah. fall. Is, is where are we modeling that players are kind of fallen off? But really, what we're what we're doing is we're changing the amount of um, effort that they're putting into it yeah. to a zero. So we're then saying because they're effectively off the edge at the end of the platform, they can't pull anymore. Exactly. Uh, that's where there's that reinforcement loop. Exactly, and the, this invites to some tactics here because technically you should put your strongest member in the back so they can pull for as much time as possible. Maybe they can bring it back. But uh, we've set it so that the players have random positions in here. Uh, now, this is just going to probably be in the favor of the right team. You can see that more and more players on the left side start falling. You can see more and more. We're down to our last player. Uh, they're a strong one, but uh, they can be eight players. So they will lose the distance as well. Now that the distance at, is at 40, you're going to see the left team, which is mostly composed of orange players, and the writing, which is mostly composed of blue players, we're going to sort them out into eliminated and advancing. In the next step, we're pulling them in. So the yellow ones were eliminated, and the blue majority ones were survivors of this round. So essentially, what's going to happen now is because we finished, uh, our gate here becomes active. We push the resource to the top, and the whole cycle begins again. We reset the rope. So this is why we had reset row because the rope is at 40 right now. We move it back to 500, so we put it back in the middle. And now we go back through the process. I'm just going to hit resume of picking teams again and having them battle it all out. And essentially, this is, uh, this is the, the tug of war game. We did get nerdy with it. We did get kind of granular with it. But it was super fun building it, I have to say. I mean, this this round, if any, like the numbers that you want to get out of this round are, you know, you put 10 players against 10 players. One of those teams is going to win. One of them is going to lose. So the, out, the outcome of this uh, this round is always going to be 50% of your players progressed for the next round and 50% of them are removed. Yeah. Uh, Ironically, the round which was supposed to be easiest, right? We could only take half of the players and move them forward. 
like we made it the most complicated we could have done this entire thing with a single deterministic gate of 50 percent um yeah. that just sent the exact number of players through into the next round but we did a bit of overkill yeah but it was a lot of fun yeah it's it's a lot of fun it was a fun model to build and uh it's it's kind of fun watching the logic go through but it was amazing that moment of realization of like that whole oh we need to get the numbers down we'll give them a small meal and make them fight each other right up until there's the exact number of players it's like that was uh, a moment i really enjoyed of like the detail that the developers and the producers went into to make the show yeah uh i'll give it back to you yeah uh do you want to do glass bridge or shall i sure i can do glass bridge I you, do, you do glass bridge sure uh yeah we have it here actually uh so the next round is glass bridge um for those of you that don't know the rules the rules were pretty simple you had a, a glass bridge to to pass and you had the option to go either left or right and uh, one of the options the bridge was stable the other one the bridge would uh, crack under your feet and you would fall um so there's no real way there's no real uh, knowledge that you could have here so you couldn't there's no way to tell which one is right or wrong um so there was always a 50 50 chance that you were either going to pass or fail at any given point uh there's a bunch of them that the players have to go through as you can see here uh, now, the golden rule of this is that once a player has been through one situation, so it either, he, uh, they either managed to pass forward or fail. Shazar, I just realized we've skipped a whole step. We've skipped our marbles. Uh, we just, oh, that's, that's my fault. Yeah, it's fine. We can go to marbles now, but I'll leave marbles to you and I'll get glass bridge back. Okay, sorry, that's my fault. That's fine. Uh, I, it's fine uh, if... It's, I'm glad that they reminded us. We do have Marvel's games. We didn't skip it. We just forgot to present it. We do. Now, one of the... Oh, I need to actually hit share screen. Would be helpful. We did this perfectly in our rehearsal. Um, so, the the first step of Marbles, and it's actually once... Shazar actually pointed this out to me, um, which is you have to have even numbers for the Marble games. Everyone has to have a partner. Um, but one of the key steps uh, that actually happens in the show is that somebody doesn't have a partner. And that's because of the whole storyline. Cesar reminded me that actually the result of the um, tug of war game just before this means that you're always going to have an even number because there's 10 players. So you're always it's always going to be in tens coming out of it. So you should always have a round number. But just to, in case in case there isn't a round number. So here I'm going to do a step. Um, somebody asked the question to the different colors represent and I think in all of the models that we're doing I just created some different colors uh, of resources just for a bit of fun so here I've started I've got my five colors I've got 43 resources coming in here the first thing I'm doing is I've got a register that's looking at the the module and so of two and because it's an odd number it's coming back with a one so therefore I'm using that to trigger this extra pool so when I hit step, it's removing that extra one resource uh, to make sure I've got a nice even number here and I'm not uh, doing anything too wrong with it. Yeah. The next thing I'm gonna do is just as we did before, I'm gonna split up my players into teams of two. Uh, so here I've got a, uh, some gates using these deterministically and these state connections uh, are um, configured so that it fits greater than one therefore two in this pool it'll pull two resources through and that kind of carries on and I've got lots of these uh, so I've got that going up to 11 so if there's 12 resources that come into that pool it's going to pull two of those into this deterministic gate and pop them into these pools for one for each of the players um, once that's done and I'll have a look at this first one and make this nice and big. So here come my two players. I've got player one, player two. I've got black resources each time that time. That's machinations randomness for me. Um, and then I've got this nice little construction here. Similar, very similar actually to the red light, green light construction. So I've got two pools. Both of these pools have got 10 resources in. I created red ones and blue ones just for a bit of uh, visual uh, difference 
And then I've got a connection coming up to this gate, which is a D5. So that's going to produce between one to five resources. Uh, and they're going to be fired over to here. I've got the same thing going back the other way, which is a D5. Once a resource comes into this pool, so I know I've got players in my game, when I hit play, this is firing this gate or allowing this automatic gate to fire. And it's got a 50% chance of triggering either of these two um, gates, which is going to move the logic. So this is each player is going to win or lose up to between one to five resources each step. And they've got a 50% chance of winning each time. So theoretically, this could go on forever. Uh, it tends to eventually produce a result after a, after an amount of time once the uh, one of these pools is empty one left there it is i'll pause it there i missed the missed it there uh but once these pool one of these pools is empty and one of these pools has got 20 resources in you'll see i'm conditioning some automatic gates i've got four of them below here uh one of these is going to um if it's if this pool is equal to 20, it's going to fire this gate. So it's going to pull this resource and it's going to send this resource to our survivors pool. Uh, if it's zero, as it was, it's going to pull that one resource and send this into our eliminated pool, uh, which I've got collected down here as my eliminated. So I'll kind of start this model again and show you what I've got going on. So we've got 42, we've got an even number, our players are being distributed. Our games are starting. Uh, there's a 50% chance of winning or losing, and you've got to win or lose a round of number each time. And that eventually is going to result in all of our games that are going on. Players are being eliminated all the time, and eventually all of our players will get through this. Now, when I move on to our main model, I'll show you what we've done to handle this. I did try and build out all 40 50 of these constructions inside one model uh, and it just got a bit mildly pointless because similar to the uh the tug of war game again this this round is going to be very much a you either win or you lose 50 percent of the players are going to get eliminated i could have spent a little bit more time and built out some extra logic to say what happens if the players don't get to a, uh, a clear winner by the end. Uh, but I thought that might just be a bit of overkill for our construction. This is a great um, example of, you know, there's lots of deterministic gates that are being used to move resources around our model and create the logic that we need. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna quickly ans uh, answer two questions which are in the Q&A. So do the colors of the token determine their attributes where their teams are selected or are they just assigned random strength attributes when assigned to team one or two? And the second one, because they kind of tie in together, could you use the colors to simulate gender since gender is always a thing in the team building sections of the series. So in our models, the colors don't represent anything. Uh, they are just there so you can, I don't know, keep track of a certain color, maybe pick a favorite or something. Um, the strength attribute is determined when the players enter their teams. It's completely random. It does not have anything to do with color. Uh, you could use the colors, the different colors to simulate gender. You can simulate age. You can simulate, I don't know, build. You can simulate a lot of stuff with it. So you can have so that orange colors are maybe elderly people and they are generally physically weaker. So you assign them lesser numbers uh, in strength and stuff like that. So you could have that approach. We don't have it in our model. The colors are just there for aesthetic purposes. So, yeah. Uh, there's another question about global properties, but I'll cover that at the end. It's probably better. Uh, uh, are we moving to Glass Bridge? Yeah, I'll stop sharing. I'll let you do yes. Glass Bridge and yes. I'll get the, the last model ready. Yes, so I already explained the idea. Uh, the most important thing here is that once a player has been through that situation and they either failed or passed, you will know which is the correct uh, path to take. So the next player will always pass forward. Now, in, we live in an, in our models here, we live in an ideal world where players obey the laws, they respect the rules. The first one's always gonna go first. They're not gonna stand there and be angry and say, okay, I'm not moving from here or stuff like that. We could make it more granular. We, we could make it like that, but it's, it's pretty pointless. So we just stick uh, to people that actually respect the rules in our case. 
Um, so during our first step, we're going to generate a number of players in here. We have 11 of them. That's quite a, uh, uh, that's quite a low number. I don't know if they're going to make it through. Uh, so what essentially happening in the first step is that we have a random chance of they getting the correct one or a, a wrong one and falling. So what's going to happen in the first step? Our first player tries, they fall. Now we approach this in the deterministic way after that. So the rest of the players know that the, the first player chose the wrong platform. So they're all going to move forward from, um, from the first platform. That's why we are using a deterministic gate here. We are sending the first resource into the 50-50 and every other resource that comes after that automatically gets uh, moved forward. So you can see the next player passes forward and every subsequent player that comes in will pass forward. Now, our player that got here will have to make another choice. So again, they go through the 50-50, they missed it, but all of the other players know the right path and move forward. And obviously this keeps on, uh, this player got it right. Everyone now knows the correct path because of the player that got it right. So they're all gonna move forward. And basically if I just hit resume, it's just gonna be the players guessing and moving forward or uh, failing. And the other ones following, uh, in the correct footsteps. So they're coming in one by one. Obviously some of them fall. Uh, this goes down until the end. I do hope some of the players will make it at least because a lot of them seem to be falling. Um, and once we're near the end, you're gonna see that uh, we're gonna have a bunch of surviving players in here. We're getting close to there. This one got it right, but what, uh, they, they didn't get it to the end, so it doesn't really matter. And I think we're out of players. So Matthew, we were two spaces away from the final, but because we only had 11 players coming in here, you can see that all of them fell. So from a game designer's perspective, it's really important that we get more than 11 players in this round, maybe what even double the amount. Do some quick plays on there. I, I think we said yep. up so we can, yep. uh, did we add? Yeah, we did. Yeah, so we do, have survivors in here. Do 10 batch plays and see yeah. uh, what we're getting. So we're going to look at the average minimum and maximum value of the, the survivors that we're getting in here. So what and we what can see is that we average around nine survive 8.8 .8 survivors. So we average around almost nine survivors. We got a minimum of three and we got the maximum of 13. So that run that we did in, a, in an interactive way was actually would have been the minimum value for us. We never got to run that bad ever again. So at least three players make it out every time in the 10 place. Obviously you can do 100, 500 to really test the extremes here. But uh, yeah, we usually get around nine players coming out of this, depending on how many enter at the beginning. There's a great question in the chat, which is um, they had to cross before, before the time was up, which set an urgency. Could you build a time constraint into the models? Yes, actually, could. we did think about exactly that, actually. And um, in the model here, the random gates are automatic. So they're automatically firing each step. What we did think we could do is actually have those triggered by a, a kind of a random event. Um, and that random event increasing the closer they got to kind of a countdown and a, and a time pool gradually draining away so that there was more chance of them moving forward the closer they were to the time step. Uh, but we try to keep this this model fairly simple uh, as, yeah. as needed. Yeah, well, we could have gone even further, maybe say that the player that guessed two of them correctly would refuse to move forward and someone else had to come and, and proceed. There could have been more logic, but we already nerded it hard on tug of war and we thought that if we do it in this one as well it's gonna be a bit too much so uh i think i'm gonna pass it back to you matthew yes so now i'm gonna do a, uh open up the main model uh daniel asked i didn't get how you modeled the fact that if one of the players get the right platform the other pass automatically so we had a deterministic gate in there uh i'm not gonna show it we can just talk about it we had a deterministic gate in there with out one output of one and the other output of 1,000. The, one, the output of one was the first one that they picked. So the first player always went into the random gate with a 50-50 chance. After the first player, regardless if they passed or not, the other players would know the correct result. So every other player coming into the deterministic gate would go into the 1K branch. So they, the, every other player would go into the second branch that automatically moves them forward. 
you only need one player to pass through a, a stage of the glass bridge in order to know which one is right or wrong. Even if they get it right or wrong, you're still going to know which one is right. So because of that, only the first player has to do the guessing. The rest of the players automatically move forward because of the deterministic gate. Yeah, there's a great comment actually in here in the um, in the chat, which is probably the game designer set the number of glass steps based on how many players were had made it to that round, which is a great a great variable that the game designer would be able to control. Yeah. Um, but what's well, the other thing that's really interesting is all the other rounds is like a a percentage chance, whereas actually the glass bridge is fairly the average is consistent the number of players that are lost. So, you know, based on how many steps there are, you can determine what the average number of players that are eliminated would be. But let's show you uh, this. So this is the entire thing all put together. And we added some extra logic um, into this model. There is a webinar coming up. That we'll what was about. that banner, Matthew? What was that banner? Sounds interesting. That, was, that was a cool banner about our next webinar. Uh, so I'll I'll have make sure Horia drops some more details in there. So one of the things we've done here is we, we've got all of the six stages in the model. Uh, one thing I should probably just talk about is the actual Squid Game itself, um, which is right over the right hand side here, and it's showing uh, my lack of understanding of the Squid Game because this is uh, a fairly deterministic way of really just looking at uh, how many players are going to make it to the to the last round to round six and basically cutting them in half randomly each time they come through a step um until there's just the one player that makes it to the very end i didn't understand all the rules of uh squid game i saw mr beast video where they played musical chairs instead uh so really the key to that game is you know one player gets uh, eliminated or half the players get eliminated with each match yeah. Um, so, uh, what do we thought we'd do next? Is I'll just do a quick poll, actually, just to get people's input of which they they thought found was the most interesting um, round out of the different six rounds: red light, green light, our uh, cookie, honeycomb cookie, tug of war, marbles, glass bridge, or then the squid game itself. Man, if I could vote, I would vote for squid game. Such such a great game, such a great one. <laughs> I th for me, I thought it was Glass Bridge, just from a um, design perspective, the logic and kind of building out that was a lot of fun. Tug of War was um, a really, it's an overly complex model, uh, but it, sometimes it's really good fun building a model like that. Um, it's uh, it, it's It was really interesting to build. I'll end the poll there and share the results. Um, Tug of War was... Uh, voted the heart, the most, the most interesting, the best one. Uh, but what I thought we'd do now is we kind of we're just over time, so we'd love to answer any questions anybody has. Uh, we were going to do a kind of a full marble game, uh, which is why we've got the three different colors, uh, five different colors of resources in this. Is we were going to play a marble game similar to what you've seen on YouTube and kind of watch this model go through and have people guess to see which color would end up being the victor. Um, it's quite a large model, and it takes a little while. Yeah, so, uh, we can answer some questions uh, in the we meantime. It, we'll, we'll leave it running. Uh, it yeah. takes about uh, 10, 15 minutes for it to go through the entire simulation of all six rounds uh, for us to produce a, uh, a winner. Uh, Someone mentioned that the parameters are not easily changed on the grass bridge, for example, uh, regarding the earlier comment on, depending on how many players you get there, there should be a certain number of steps. Uh, we can make that. So we can make it so we add uh, more bridges for the players to cross, uh, depending on the number. Again, we wanted to keep that model fairly simple because as Matthew said, this uh, whole picture model already runs in about 10 minutes. Uh, we kind of went, hard on the red light, green light, and the tug of war one. If we were to build them as individuals, the way we presented them, we can make them much more granular. So we can encompass a lot of things in there. Uh, we can encompass stamina, we can encompass fear, we can encompass, there, there will be, they will be presented as random chances, but they will give a more realistic approach to the game, I suppose. Um, but yeah, the, 
the approach that we had for glass bridge was intentional to keep it simple to not uh, take a lot of space and uh, computing power yeah. and um, the and i guess you forgot to have the chance of getting killed outside of the game at the dorm between rounds well we added that for uh, what for the tug of war one right just to yeah. get the perfect teams uh, i suppose that could be added for each round if we wanted to it could be a random chance that some of the players just get killed off but it would probably be just like a one percent random gate that calls some of the player out uh, it's not that uh, much of an addition to the to the model so uh, but Ooh. definitely could be added so some of the extra logic that's in this um overall model is just to control when each round is is starting so the first thing I did, um, so at the end of the red light, green light model, you'll see this little construction here. Uh, I wanted to keep the colors consistent. So I've got five different colored resources coming in. I wanted to keep track of how many people actually survived each round. So I'm using these node connections, but I wanted these node connections to um, keep the same colored resources going into the next round. So right now we've got a lot of uh, black resources that have made it, not very many blue ones. Uh, orange is doing quite well and green's uh, a bit behind. We've got uh, a countdown, a little bit more time to go on the countdown, but this way I could keep track of how many um, resources of each color came through. So I know we've got a couple of other questions. Have yeah, you about question? six of them. Do the colors of the tokens representing the players, I oh, don't know, this one was answered. Uh, is it possible to make subgraphs in machinations if these games are all identical that seems like it would be very useful uh, i'm not sure what you mean by subgraphs yeah, i'm not sure either one of the the key workflows that we're seeing a lot of game designers use would be here i've built a model of all six games going on simultaneously and the resources going through all six of them um quite often what we find uh this might be a bit of overkill but what you could do you could take each of the individual models you could do some testing um and then you could then uh, apply that to that very simple model that i started off with and we could look in on um how many resources or what the actual ratios are from our models and apply that to that high level so you've kind of got different levels of granularity across different models okay uh i might have missed something but the global properties are those something that are fixed uh or can you create your own global properties so the four global properties on the right that Matthew is highlighting they are fixed uh you can call them out by using the numbers between the square brackets um you can create sort of global parameters for yourself if you have a pool or a register that goes into a bunch of places uh but that does require a number of connections uh for wherever you want to use it we have in our roadmap to make more more global properties available for use uh it's something that we're looking into so yeah the short answer is those are fixed you can add more if you want to but you need to use connections for that uh, how would you go by simulating a player resource deciding not to move anymore? Uh, the same way that Matthew did in the red light, green light, where there's a chance that the player decide to move forward or not, a 25%. Uh, the 25% that's in there, it doesn't have to be a fixed value. You can actually manipulate that number. So you can make it that a player, if they guess correctly two times, their chance of deciding to move forward is lower and lower. So I would use uh, triggers with random chances like Matthew did in red light, green light, decreasing over time. So maybe the closer you are to the end, the less likely you are to move forward because you're so close to finishing and you don't want to fall off right at the end. Uh, you know, maybe if you started later as the 16th player, you're not eager to go in front of someone. So there's a bunch of factors that could come in here, but the way I would manipulate it is using triggers and random chances. Uh, how can you choose which resource connection will be the first in deterministic distribution how is the order of nodes uh, the order is the first one that you build will have uh matthew if you can show them the node id so each node in machinations when you select it has a node id that you can see on the top there 
those node, di node IDs are generated when the item is placed on the canvas. So whenever a node or a connection is placed on the canvas, they generate an ID and the ID is increasing every time. So for deterministic gates, they always pick the connection with the lower ID first. So the connection that was first placed. So in our case for glass bridge, we picked the one connection that goes into the random gate. We always place that one first, and then we place the overhead connection with one K. So it always picks the, the one going into the random gate first. And how might you model the ability for the players to agree to opt out of the game at any time? Ha, that's a good one. Uh, but uh, in the end, it's going to be a random chance again, right? Because you don't really know, like, unless you have a look at each individual player and monitor their level of stress or something or have personality traits for them, which I'm guessing is a lot, like, it's very overkill to do that. Other than that, it's probably going to be a random chance, honestly, because uh, maybe the closer they are to the end, the less likely they are to accept. Maybe after the first round where they had the shock, uh, they would be more likely to accept. I don't know. It's it's a hard one to answer. It depends. But again, it would probably use randomness unless you're monitoring each individual player, which seems way too complicated for me, at least in my opinion. There's a question uh, in chat. If you wanted to change the behavior of the game that each pair of players in the marbles round, you'd have to make that change in each individual game. Seems like a lot of manual updating. Is there a better way in machinations? Um, so there's a few ways of doing that um, inside machinations. The, probably the, the most obvious one would actually, to, rather than having multiples of these constructions, it would actually be to um, have a have a single construction that resets and just fire all the players through that each time so you're only ever updating one. Obviously, the, the thing with the marble game is that 50% of the players are going to be eliminated during that session each time anyway. So the relevance of it is pretty slim. Um, this is more for aesthetic and uh, making a fun construction than any uh, real world use for that, of having all of these different constructions going on. Um, so it's uh, if you did have a construction where you had lots of these uh the, my best advice would be to, to kind of get used to copying and pasting and some best practices of copying and pasting models oh my god matthew pet the cat, oh. loves, um, cat. Yeah, he loves to be on a zoom call Maybe and there was another question that i said i would answer at the end which i believe was what i, I don't remember it but i believe it was like what's the difference between plus one and equal on a state connection yeah. yeah, that's the one. So plus one essentially means that for each resource that you add inside the pool, another resource will be added at the end of a pool. It does not necessarily have to be plus one, it can be plus two. So then for each resource added in the left pool, two resources will appear in the right pool. Uh, the difference between plus one and equal is that if you drain the right pool, as Matthew was doing in his example, where he showed that, okay, we can track players because we generate a number of players and we use plus one, and we drain the ones on the right, so we keep the number on the left. If you would use equal there, that number would still be the number on the left. So equal always overrides. The number of pools, uh, the number of resources that you have in the origin pool will be the number of resources that you have in the output pool. Plus one only adds the resources there. So what happens to them in the right pool does not concern the left pool. That's that's probably the best way to explain it. So equal is, is a more, um, how do I say, a more tight connection between the two nodes than plus one. Uh, in general, when overwriting, when trying, especially when you're using registers for labels to um, to update them, I recommend using equal instead of plus one. We're just getting to the end of the glass bridge level. We've got a red resource, a couple of red resources, then orange ones. Uh, a whole bunch have been eliminated. We've got our first red player that's made it across the glass bridge. I'm not sure how many there are in total. Uh, someone asked about the links to the models. You will receive them uh, on your email. Uh, with the recording and you can also find them on community so yeah i'll be publishing all of these on the on the community um straight after this 
session. I just need to do that. I'm just going to wait for this model to finish before I uh, do that to it. Uh, so we've got two blacks, blue, couple of oranges. Zoom in, Matthew. Zoom in, oh, zoom in. Getting tense. That's it. They're okay, now we're into, in the squid into game. The squid game. Uh, so there's going to be eight players that go into the squid game. Four of them are eliminated. Oh, it looks like green and black. It's two black ones going into the very final, and our very final winner of our entire end-to-end -end squid game was one black resource. <laughs> Sorry, Joe, one that picked a different color. I'm sorry for the bookmakers. For, uh... <laughs> if anybody um, would like to come and chat to us or has got any thoughts or any opinions about Squid Game, uh, the models we've built today, please do. If you raise your hand in just by clicking down at the bottom, we can promote you into a, a panelist. You can come and have a chat to us. But in the meantime, we'd love to answer any other questions that anybody has. I have one, but you're going to answer it, Matthew. Uh, thanks for the webinar. Always great to see these models. Thank you very much. When is the social platform coming to share our models with the community? Hey, it's here. What a, what an interesting question. <laughs> In fact, look, if I, if I do this right now, I can put this public on community. Uh, so I'm going to publish this model out there right now. Um, diagram, privacy, change to public. And if I come in here, and I find myself is some of the stuff that Mihai has been doing just in the community. I'll go to my profile. Uh, here's all the crazy games, that, models that I've made. And uh, somewhere in here, eventually it'll update. It's quite a big model. It might take a few moments, but these are all the models that I've built. Everything from mildly inappropriate um, all the way through to uh, all sorts of different game logics uh, that I've built over the past year or so so please do come and check check them out and uh, be sure to create your profile one of the things we've been talking to a lot of um game designers about is how to kind of get your profile looking good you can update your image i've used our 101 model that i built a little while ago as my background image got a nice description it says i'm in brasov romania that's where i aspire to be from um just to be closer to cesar rather than where i'm actually from None of us is from Brush of Romania, just so you know. <laughs> but the <That's> team. <laughs> Where I aspire to be from, it looks like a lovely city. It is. Can we come and hang out with you and Mona in um, in Bucharest? Yeah, all of all of our videos, all of our webinars will get posted on YouTube, so we'll pop this up on YouTube um, uh, fairly soon. It normally takes us a couple of days to get the recording back from Zoom. Uh, we edit it together to make it look pretty and we uh, pop it up on YouTube. And as I mentioned, all of the all of the content that we've done, all of the different models will be out there as well. I'm interested in how you collaborated on this project. What did your workflow look like? Oh, oh boy. What a question. Um, so it, it did genuinely, it started off just while I was having a beer on a Friday. Uh, I, I found the glass bridge level really interesting and I wanted to build a model of it. So I spent a couple, probably just a couple of minutes just kind of doodling out some logic for the glass bridge level. Um, and I then posted it out on our internal Slack just as a, like, oh, look, I built the glass bridge level. Have a look at it. Um, Mo uh, from our community thought it looked really good and said, oh, we should, we should do some content on it. Um, and I think the next one I did was red light, green light. So I built that model and just sent it round. Uh, and then I did the, um, I mean, the Wonderful. cookie one probably took all of about five minutes um, just to kind of doodle that one together. The tug of war one I started, uh, it worked fine just about, but then I had Cesar look at it because I was massively over-engineering it. I mean, it's over-engineered as it is, but that was just getting ridiculous. Um, actually... What we then did is we then just kind of, once we built the entire, all six games, just kind of cut them down into one and uh, got it ready so that we could walk through each of the different sessions individually uh, before doing a big reveal and, and a full kind of marble run type model. 
Please yeah, we on. had the we had the the shows as reference, so it was I, it wasn't very hard to create the models uh, for us because we knew what the intention was, we knew what the outcome was supposed to be, uh, so we could adjust the chances accordingly. Matthew did most of the hard work, so I was there for uh, just tidying some things up. So. No, but it was an, it was a fun fun collaboration. It's really good when when it's um, such a simple simple game mechanics that you just take. They don't take long to understand what each of the mechanics are in each of the different rounds inside um, Squid Game. Apart from Squid Game itself, I couldn't work out how to build a model for it. I was thinking of doing a massively over engineered like the strength of each player randomly generated. Like what are the odds of them? being able to cross and be able to use both their feet and things like that. It just felt like that was just going to be um, showing off and over-engineering it too much. Make it a fair point. But almost always with my with the workflows, I do genuinely start off with that really, really simple um, high core game loop first. Uh, use that to just make sure I'm clear on what the the high level um, steps look like in the game, and then break out each section into its individual components, build out that section, uh, and either bring it into one large model or, or keep them separate. Um, I'll quite often there's often an Edom in the Edom um, kind of a step in between those, which is where I'll build an interactive model. So I would build a um, build that high level model, then as I'm building the next one, rather than trying to make it all automatic, I'll quite often do it so it's interactive and I'll kind of test it and build out the game using that logic first. And then I'll go into a full, um, into kind of automating it so I can do some quick plays. Well, I did think actually, uh, your comment there, there's no stipulation in Squid Game that there can be only one winner, though, correct? I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, there was only one winner in the in the thing, but I did. I was very tempted in that last step just to leave it as one round of Squid Game, 50% of the players eliminated, this is the winners. Um, I don't know whether or not, who knows what the game designer or the, the, the program writers would have done if they'd been, if they'd written it so more and got through. There's obviously some some fun that they can have with it in terms of they don't necessarily have to uh, leave it up to chance. They've got full control over that world when they're making it. I agree with, with you there. The game, the game won't end unless there's only one survivor at the end of the game. And actually, well, I won't go into too many details. I'm ma I've massively overthought Squid Game in the whole process. I've watched the series a couple of times now. It's fantastic. Very much looking forward to the to the next series when it comes. I'm sure there'll be another series of it, and I hope they build their models in machinations to test them thoroughly uh, before they make it. Maybe they did for the first one as well. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, as I mentioned, Hori is going to drop. I think he's already dropped the links to our next webinar. Uh, we've got some really exciting um, content coming up. Obviously huge amount of talk we were doing recently about the metaverse um we did a, a fantastic session that's now available on youtube where we were looking at um kind of what what the hell is the metaverse what is it what does it mean how are we all gonna how's it gonna change our lives next one we're gonna be talking with rec room on user generated content and how that user generated content will lead to the metaverse so it's going to be a really, really interesting session. Very different from today's. Today's more about showing you how machinations worked. That, that next ses session is more about um, what's going on in the world of game design. Um, we'd love anybody's feedback on if this structure of our webinars is working. If you'd like us to do any particular subjects or there's something you're interested in, or even if you'd like to come and give a talk, uh, please let us know and get in contact with us. We've got some exciting um, content planned as always, uh, but we love getting input from our users on what you'd like to see. Perfect. Has everybody seen the 
Mr. Beast version of Squid Game. I think it had over a hundred million views in like the first couple of days of it being out. Just amazing. That was a some of the highest production quality YouTube content I've seen for quite a while. Just phenomenal. Yeah, really high high value, but really well done. I have to say. Yeah, uh, it's a great question there. I'd like like if you would give out some tests or assignments. Um, Definitely. That's actually something we have in our roadmap. We are going to be um, doing some further development on our whole onboarding and training. Um, and part of that will be at some point where we will release kind of standardized tests on machinations. Yeah, the, we will have some sort of questions and answers in the, in the tutorial section. So. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Please do enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot for coming along and taking part with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you all at the next session. Thank you very much. Have a good one.